hello, hello, and welcome to Before the Peace. I'm Jenna Moreland, and I'm here with my little birdie, Trey Lapashinsky. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> that song you just heard was written and performed by our guest last month, Gary Oker. But before we start talking about today's guest, Connie Gray Eyes, we want to just recognize first that we're recording this podcast on traditional Denezal land. So to talk a little bit about Connie, just before we get into the interview portion, uh, she's a fairly well-known Indigenous advocate in Fort St. John in the Peace Region. Uh, she's also the Northern Case Manager for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls through the Indian Residential School Survivor Society. Yeah, and throughout the pandemic, she would cook meals for people in the community, and she actually told us that on average, she has about 50 blocks of butter in her fridge. So <laughs> she loves to bake. Uh, but, and actually her cinnamon buns were excellent. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. Yeah. She's helped lots of families and friends raise money for different causes, uh, in the community. And really her advocacy is something we wanted to focus on. Yeah. And as with last month's episode where the theme was definitely say qua, this month's episode is going to be on advocacy. And we thought Connie would be the perfect guest. Um, she was very, very heavily influenced by her father and her mother. Uh, Connie actually didn't mention this too much in the episode, so I thought that I really wanted to mention it because talking with her before, she had told me stories about how her father would bring in people from the street for food, and she said that you know it was her father's caring that kind of sparked that want to help others. Actually, in an interview I did with her earlier this year, the first interview I ever did with Connie, first time I ever talked to her, she said that her mom and dad set her up for her life's work. And that kind of sets the stage for the story that she's about to tell and kind of leading up to, you know, the trials and tribulations she went through to where she's at now and helping others in the community. One more thing before we get into the episode, I just want to say thank you to Troyer Ventures for sponsoring this program. It's very close to our hearts and we're just very grateful that we have the opportunity to do this. So thank you, Steve and Troyer Ventures. Uh, without further ado, here is Connie Gray Eyes. You're a Big Stone Creek Cree First Nation member, but you were born and raised in Fort St. John, right? Right. So how did your family stay in touch with the roots and like in the band? You know, um, before any of us were born, my dad uh, met my mom and brought her to BC and they went to work in a logging camp in one Um And, you know, this was where they decided they were going to build their, their roots and, and, and stay uh, in BC, you know, we're from a northern community in Alberta. We are still in the Treaty 8 territory. And, um, you know, I I often think about um, had we actually been raised in, in our nation that many of us would have gone to residential school. Um, my dad worked as a logger. My mom also worked at the camp and she was a cook and she helped out at the camp. And uh, back then, you know, the logging camps were you were there stayed there for a, for long periods of time um in the early 70s we, uh my my father um and my mother uh lived in grand haven and then my father purchased a house in the middle of fort st john we were just a couple blocks from the old hospital and that's where we were born and raised and that what year was that when did he that buy was the house? probably i would say 73 okay then he bought a double lot uh, we were right in the center of town and, um, you know, it was the perfect spot because the, the arena, the, the rink was right there. And, you know, the hospital was two blocks away. There was corner stores two blocks away. Uh, the, the, the co-op mall was right there. And it was honestly, you know, um, now that I think back of what an accomplishment that was for my, for my father to purchase a house for us and work so hard that, you know, we lived in town and, and we, we had a good life. And you said that if you had not been here, you possibly would have been taken to the residential schools. Is that because you lived here and not on? I honestly think that, you know, um, a lot of my relatives that are my age and my siblings' ages, I'm the second youngest, um, all went to residential schools in our nations. Um, and, you know, we're, all, we're, we're upwards of 48 and up. My, my siblings and I know. And, you know, we're at that right age where we very well could have attended residential schools um, had we not been 
raised and born here in Fort St. John. Um, I, I'm so grateful for that because I, I do believe that you know, we would have been forced to go to those residential schools that my mom and dad had to go to. And, you know, my dad came here to make a better life for him and my mom. And, you know, I, I can't say enough about the hard work that my mom and dad did to raise all of us. How many? Uh, I have, I have six brothers and five sisters and, okay. Uh, okay. and I have two, two, uh, step siblings that are, are passed away. And actually three of my brothers have passed away as well. Oh, wow. So there's... But a full house growing up then. Oh yeah. 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 It was, uh, actually four of my brothers. Um, it was, it was so filled with love and you know what, now that I look back the way we would battle over the one bathroom, you know, trying to get six girls, um, trying to get ready in the morning for school. And, you know, um, our house was always jam packed. It was always jam packed. And, you know, even now at, at our celebrations, we still go to my mom and dad's house. It's, uh, it's now that the family is so huge, we pile in there, we sit on the floors, uh, to eat dinner together. Um, and you know, there, my mom, my mom has now dozens of grandchildren that, that come and, you know, there's still eight of us. And then we have a couple of siblings, sisters that are adopted into our family and they come as well. And it's crazy. Like I post pictures of our, of our Christmas celebrations and our Thanksgivings and our birthdays. And like, people are like, I can't believe there's that many people in your mom's house. <laughs> That's awesome though. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, you know, what? growing up in Fort St. John that way, um, you know, I, 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 I just, give so much credit to my mom and dad for their hard work to give us that kind of life. You know, um, a lot of my relatives say on the regular, you're so lucky that you didn't have to grow up here. You know, that you had so many opportunities. You know, we got to do swimming lessons and skating and, you know, um, join vo volleyball and all kinds of opportunities that, that aren't very, um, they're not really as accessible on so, in some nations. So, you know, we, we were just so lucky. Did your parents, your mom and dad, did they ever talk about residential schools growing up? No. No? You know, um, it's funny because I, I actually attended the Kamloops Indian Residential School uh, as a student. Um, doing a program called NITEP, the Native Indian Teachers Education Program. And I went there in 1990, and our classes were actually in that school. So we had to go there. And I did a report on, we had to do an essay, and uh, I did mine on residential schools. And I called my dad to talk to him about it. And my dad just, he absolutely refused to talk about it. But all he said was, you know what? My, my mom had passed away. My dad wasn't really able to take care of us and had not been me being sent there. I probably wouldn't have had, um, you know, food, shelter. And, um, and he said, and that's what I, that's what I take from it. He said, I don't think about anything other than that. Um, I just, you know, I learned to read and write, and he would not ever talk about what actually happened, except that the gratefulness of being able to learn to read and write and to have food, even if it was rotten, and to have a roof over his head. So, you know, I'm, I think I'm, I'm really, I'm sad that my dad couldn't talk about it. You know, my dad has passed away. Um, it's been 17 years. And I think about how long he actually lived with that trauma. And it makes sense. My dad quit drinking in 1977 when I was six years old. And it's funny because when I think about it, I was always like, you know, I was one of the first people in my family to quit drinking. I actually wasn't. It was my dad that led the way. You know, like everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know, you quit drinking. And you know, that's... I, I changed the cycle, but I actually didn't. It was my dad. You know, 
My dad showed us hard work, perseverance. To be able to walk away and to lose your children the way that my mom and dad have and to still not turn to alcohol and drugs. My mom has never drank, never smoked cigarettes, never done drugs. Um, but my dad, you know, he, he struggled. And I attribute that to probably the trauma from being in residential school. But he also showed us that strength and that resilience to walk away from it. You know, we lost, uh, we lost my brother in 1977 and um he he died from carbon monoxide poisoning him and his girlfriend and my cousin was with him and you know that was really a turning point for our family i believe for my dad and um it it actually changed the course of all of our lives because my dad stopped drinking and he was wasn't that he wasn't before but I honestly had the best father you could ask for. You know, I, I often talk about the pain that I still feel over the loss of my father. I was uh, my dad's baby. Uh, there's no bones about it. My siblings teased me about it incessantly. And, uh, you know, I really wish that my children would have been able to, to meet him. You know, I, I talk about him all the time with my kids. And, you know, that I don't know if... if you haven't lost this apparent that pain that you feel um when my dad passed away had I not been pregnant with my first son I probably would have drank it was that traumatic um but I was pregnant with my son and I couldn't you know my dad was so happy I was gonna have a baby and he couldn't wait to see this baby right and uh the night before my dad passed away he told my sisters to give his baby a hug and then said, she's going to have the cutest little baby. Uh, don't come here too early because I'm going to have a really good night. And I got the phone call at about three in the morning. that My father had passed away. And, you know, um, I do think that he just wanted to spare us from that trauma of, of what happened. You know, my mom also has a very uh, long history of pain from being in residential school, physical pain as well. And um, she just recently started talking about it, you know, kind of the experience that she had. And, you know, to, to know that she has physical trauma from it and um, emotional trauma is something that, you know, we grapple with because my mother is 90 years old and, you know, she has lived that whole life hanging on to that, that and not putting it on us. You know, in, in a lot of ways, the experiences that my parents have had, um, now that we know about triggers and intergenerational trauma, we become much more gentle with each other. Um, and, you know, my mom worked her whole life in a kitchen from being in the residential school because that's where she was placed. My mother never learned to read and write um, because when my mom went to residential school, she was in the kitchen. Okay, so because she was in the kitchen, she wasn't allowed to learn? No, she was, she was there and she was put to work. So she actually never attended classes. And recently it came out um, that my grandmother actually thought that my mother worked at the school because she wasn't going to classes and she was in the kitchen peeling potatoes and carrots and doing dishes. And, and she was a young girl. And, you know, so that just kind of recently has come out. And, and as my mother gets older, you know, um, she's shared a little bit more. And it, I, I don't think that, um, you know, I've always been like my dad, my dad, my dad, my dad. And now I just look at my mom and I just think like, man, the, the, the things that you have done and the, the life that you have given us, you know, working, walking us to school, going to work in the kitchen, doing dishes and prepping for chefs and then walking and getting us from school and taking us home, going back to work, coming home and, and cooking and cleaning. And I just think like, 
my God, like you were so strong. You were you were the hardest working woman I've ever, ever seen. She really is. You know, um, so if she didn't drink or anything growing up, when you started abusing substances, like how old were you? I think the I, I want to say the first time that I ever did drugs, I was 13. Wow. I was smoking weed. And um, and I started doing, I started trying hard drugs at the age of 14, about grade nine. And uh, started, I actually did cocaine for the first time at the age of 14. And that just started a series of like weekends, coke binging, drinking. Um, and it's, it's funny because I would go through these stages where I wouldn't do it at all for, you know, two, three, four months. And then I'd fall back into it. And, you know, I know that it is a, a direct result of abuse that, that we suffered as children. You know, my mom and my, my dad worked constantly. And then you have people that offer to take care of you, take you on camping trips. You know, it's that whole group. It happens when when people know. You know they know when when where and who they can. That that's the truth. People watch for that. Predators watch for that. And that's not saying that, you know, anything that my parents did was wrong, um, or that they were unaware or or didn't care to notice. We were just really good at hiding it. You know, um, you don't want to to talk about it really survival yeah 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 and um it's funny because i actually talked with with a, a local person that's really close to me we call him red sister and and i asked him just kind of offhandedly can you like look up who used to live where at certain times because you know what i've, I've always thought about um confronting the person um and I've never, ever actually followed through with that because I don't think that that right now at this stage in my life, I can actually mentally handle that. I'm, I'm working through so much trauma all the time with my work um, that I don't, I don't know. You don't even know where to start because, you know, this is, we're talking 44 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So um, with my mom, you know, the fact that she never drank or done drugs or smoked cigarettes, it, it makes sense why she's, she was so upset when any of us do that. Right. Um, but when, when I did start delving deeply into, into drugs was probably where, where it became a real serious, well, it was, it was a problem when I was in high school, junior high school. But when I started in high school was when it, it got worse, um, I was not going to school. I was drinking and drugging all weekend. Somehow I managed to graduate and I went on to college. And Kamloops is where I fell. It was bad. Um, and you know what? Like I went there last year and I put tobacco down. I said, I'm, I'm reclaiming Kamloops because this was where I, I had my worst addiction. Um, and I went to the, the Indian residential school last year and it was about two weeks ago to this day. And I put tobacco down and I said, I want to reclaim this because this, this place of pain for me. And uh, it kind of makes sense why I felt that way when I was there, because at the time, you know, in the early nineties, we didn't talk about residential schools. I asked my mom and dad, they didn't say anything about it. You know, there was no, real information that people actually were listening to about what happened in those places. And um, one, share, one story that I'd like to share about that is, you know, when I was really doing bad there, um, my dad was sending thousands of dollars because I was buying drugs like you wouldn't believe, and my dad was constantly bailing me out. I'm not even joking, like sending me a thousand dollars here Three days later, two thousand. Five days later, we did another five hundred. Did he know what it was for? Yeah, yeah. I think he just didn't want me to get hurt. Yeah, and um, you know, I was always his baby, so he he took care of me. You know, 
and I took advantage of that. And it's something I regret to this day. You know, I wish that my dad was alive now because now I'm in a position where I could, I could re- reciprocate that, and spoil him. Um, and uh, so one day, um, I was owing some drug dealers, and out of the blue, my brother Clifford, who is now passed away, showed up outside my townhouse with his truck. He's like, grab what you can, but you're coming home. You're not, you're not going down like this. And he literally packed up my stuff, put it in his truck, and we drove to Fort St. John. And I never went back. Um, and, you know, we had a really good talk. I, I, my brother Clifford was a very hard worker. He had a company, you know, two children of his own. And, you know, we talked about that good life that I'm supposed to have. And he, he was the one that taught me how to drive. Um, and had he not shown up, who knows what would have happened. But for whatever reason, my brother Clifford came to the rescue and saved me. You know, um, I know that I have a responsibility to live a good life for, for my children because I was role modeled that. Um, and my dad said once that when somebody you love passes away, you should honor their life by changing yours. And that's how I ended up on the road to recovery. You know, my, I was in a basement doing crack cocaine and my family was trying to call me. I was just ignoring their calls. And then my good friend that I've been friends with since we were five calls me and I answered it because it's her, right? She's like, honey, you got to get to the hospital. Something's going on. I said, what? She said, something's going on. You've got to get to the hospital. So she goes, shower up. I'm coming to get you. And I got to the hospital too late. My, my brother had died from a heart attack. And uh, I made the decision standing there looking at him laying there. That was it for me. I, I was going to change my life. How old were you? Um, that was, I'm going on 18 years of recovery. I was 40, 32. Okay, so that was kind of the catalyst then. That, yeah. Okay. It, it is what made me decide to quit drinking and doing drugs. I was looking at him and I was thinking, if this good, hardworking man who you know, takes care of his kids, he works hard and he just died from a heart attack. And there's me in the basement doing crack cocaine, watching the clock, hoping that my heart doesn't burst. I remember sometimes holding on to my... And, and the, the, the heartbeat that you have after doing, you know, a, a big hoot and thinking, I think my heart's going to stop. And looking at a clock and timing it, thinking, okay, this is not good. And I just, I, I decided then that I was going to honor his life and I was going to live the good one. Uh, that following February 13th, I told my family that I was going to treatment. Um, I never really mentioned it to anybody prior to that. And, uh, and I left. I went to just down the, down the highway, Northwinds Healing Center, and, uh, and that started me on that path. You're coming up on 19 years, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any advice for anybody listening who might be having issues with substance abuse? You know, um, everybody's always pushing for somebody to go to treatment. It just won't go to treatment. All I need to do is get them to go to treatment. And it isn't that, you know, it is, you, you can say, you know what, I'm making you go to treatment and set it all up. But if you're, if you're the one that's doing that, it isn't going to work because that person has to want it. And many times we don't allow people to hit rock bottom. My rock bottom seeing my brother dead on a table. Somebody else's rock bottom might not be living. Somebody's rock bottom can be less than. Um, but until you allow that to happen, it, you know, it, it isn't going to do any good. We cannot, um, there's such a fine line between enabling and supporting. And my advice is to keep those options open for them but don't do it for them because they have to do it for themselves. You know, when you go to, when you go to those kinds of programs, they give you tools to recognize triggers. You know, 
so many times people have come right out of treatment and they're like, hey, how's it going? You know, I just got out of treatment. And then they're like, I'm going to go hang out with these people. And I'm like, you think that's a good decision to make? You know, you're fresh out of recovery. Um, that's the last people you should be hanging around with. You know, you shouldn't be around drinking and drugging until you're stronger. Um, there's really only been one time since I've been sober that I wanted to drink. Uh, and that was when my niece Harley died. She uh, died from fentanyl. And she was young. She was 21. And I remember getting the phone call to go there. My sister called. And she's like, get down there, get down there. And I showed up and my nephew was standing outside and he was crying. And I said, what is going on? And he said, just go upstairs, go upstairs. Something's going on. And I went in and they had her laying on the floor and they had her shirt cut open. And they looked at me and they said, who are you? And I said, I'm her aunt. And they said, can you hold the elevator? And I remember them bringing her in and looking at her and I knew she was gone. Her ears were blue. And um, they said, okay, we're going to take her to the hospital. Uh, we'll meet you there. And I was driving and I got there and they wouldn't let us in. And, you know, we were all sitting in this room. And it was a bunch of her friends that were there at the time. And the nurse came in and she said, which one of you is her aunt? And I said, I am. And he said, we're very sorry. And I, I just, all I, all I could think of was, how am I going to tell my sister? Right? How am I going to tell her this? So she comes in and she was coming in from town because she lived in Blueberry. And um, she come walking down the hallway and I looked at her and, and I had tears coming out of my eyes and she just dropped. And I had to tell her, you know, they did everything that they could. And they couldn't save her. And, you know, I remember going into the room with her and her just holding her and you know, trying to warm her up. It was just absolutely the worst. And um, I left there and I was like, I am either going to go and buy a bottle or I'm going to go buy a pack of cigarettes. And I had quit smoking for a lot of years. And uh, I went and bought a pack of smokes. <laughs> I wanted to go and buy a bottle. I just, it was that painful because I loved her so much. Like, we loved her so much. And uh, it, it really hurt to lose her that way. And um, it, there really is something to, you are who you surround yourself with. And if you surround yourself with people that um, drink and do drugs, that are negative, and that is the kind of life that you are going to have. Um, you know, I, if some friends are like, well, they're hanging around with these people. And I'm like, they're, they're pretty well known to be drug addicts. And they're like, well, they wouldn't do that. And I'm like, I'll tell you right now that people that don't do cocaine and those kinds of drugs don't hang around with those that do. Um, that's, a, that's a warning. That's, uh, so the culture in Fort St. John growing up, did that contribute to the substance abuse, like the racism and everything? You know, I think that um, we often forget about all of that trauma that happens when you're growing up in a town that has blatant racism mm -hmm. that happens. Um, I was actually just mentioning the other day about that Halloween party where there was a couple there, an older couple. I don't know their ages. I don't know who they are. Um, but the, the male was dressed up as a priest with bloody handprints. And the female was dressed in an orange shirt. No. That says every child matters. And I was thinking about that and the trauma that those indigenous youth that were there had to witness. Apparently, they had gone and confronted them and were told, get over it, shut up, oh. type thing. And... It is those kinds of, of situations that our youth witness and see that, that contribute to that trauma that they start packing on. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to relieve that trauma without going to a counselor or, or knowing or being shown how to work through that is alcohol and drugs. You know, um, it's the same thing when somebody on social media posts a picture of, of the person in the bank and says, look at these drunken Indians. They're always in here. Not realizing that that stems from those 
situations of residential schools, day schools, and all of that trauma that has happened, that has broken that chain of that good life that we were meant to have. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you, if you don't have that understanding of, of that kind of trauma, you can't possibly understand why somebody is passed out in the bank. Um, the one picture showed uh, a lady and a man in the bank. She was passed out cold. Pants were starting to be rolled down. And all of these comments are laughing. And I'm the only one that commented, this looks like a possible assault. And instead of taking a phone call and calling the police, you took a picture. That says a lot about you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, our youth, because of social media, are being exposed so much to, to racism and sexism and all kinds. And of you didn't have social media to deal with growing up. God, thank God. Yeah. You know, it was bad. Um, somebody was asking me about bullying the other day. And, you know, I, I had mentioned about uh, there was a young boy that got beat up. And I said, back in my day, that, you know, if somebody called me a squaw, you were getting your head kicked in, period. There was no ifs, ands, and buts about it. It wasn't like, let's have a talking circle. No, it was like, you're going to get your teeth punched in. That's the way it was back then. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, some people were like, yeah, you were a real bully when, when you were growing up. And, and um, then I get these wonderful messages over the years from people that, messaged me and said, you know what, I want to thank you because you didn't let those people beat me up. You didn't let them bully me. And, you know, you stepped in and punched them in the head when they were trying to... So you're kind of protecting them in a way. Yeah. And so I have these two different types of of person that I was, you know, like I, I, I know that I was a bully, but I also know that I also protected from bullies. It, it's the weirdest situation and... In, in, thought process for me because you know while I'm 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 not ashamed of of the bullying because a lot of it was stemming from racial uh things being directed at me and you know there's no excuse for beating people up you know it was young dumb uh, you know now I now I I fight with words and intelligence um but man, there's some times where I'm, I, I'll even, I'll even say it. I'm like, man, the old me, I wish the old me would come out <laughs> once in a while, you know? And, yeah. and, but I know that that's, that's not the way yeah. I'm meant to have a good life. My parents raised us right. You know, um, back in those days though, in the, in the early eighties, late seventies, it was cowboys versus Indians type scene. It really was, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go to school when my older siblings went because it was, it was pretty rampant. And, uh, and now with our youth today, having to see that, um, the only, the only hope that I, that I know is happening is that more and more youth are being exposed to their, their traditions and learning to be proud of who they are, uh, as individuals, as indigenous people, as indigenous young women and men, um, and knowing and learning that just because somebody says it doesn't make it so. That, that's a big one. Um, I, I talk to a lot of youth, um, and, and I tell them that, you know, that, that, that doesn't make it, it, it true. And uh, the trauma that you're experiencing now, there's help. We, we can get you in touch with somebody, and, and you can learn the tools on how to, to deal with that. Um, so, you know, there's lots of youth groups. That I, uh, one of the communities... Blueberry has their own youth group that, that a youth started. Um, and I, I want to say it's back to where happiness dwells. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're taking charge and they're leading the way. Um, they're saying, no, this is not okay. You don't get to talk to me like that. I, I'm a proud, uh, young, indigenous youth. And I'm going to learn about all of those things that were taken away from us or tried to be taken away from us. Um, when we had our September 30th uh, event, um, you know, we showcased youth dancing. You know, that those are one of the things that they wanted to take away from us, our song and dance and our traditions and our ceremonies. So it was really important to showcase them. Say, you know what, like these youth, 
they're still dancing, they're still learning those ceremonies, and uh, and we're still here. You know? So can you tell us a little bit about what Amnesty International is and how you started working with them? Sure. Um, Amnesty International is the one of the world's largest human rights organizations, and I ended up meeting them in Ottawa. Um, a good friend of mine uh, used to live just uh, down the block from my family um, for a lot of years, works for CUPE in Alberta, and she became involved with MMIWG and contacted me because this is her local community where she was born and raised. Can you just say what MMIWG is? Sure. Uh, missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Okay. And um, she she messaged me and she said, you know, I would like to go to that big vigil in Ottawa that they have every year on October 4th. And I was wondering if you would like to come with me because, you know, you've been doing the Sisters and Spirit vigils in Fort St. John for a few years. And I think it'd be important to bring the voices of the North to Ottawa. And um, so I went. And the first couple of years I went, um, I, I was so shocked when I got there because they're like, oh, they want you to speak. And I was like, what? Like... I didn't know that's what you wanted me to do. And um, so I ended up talking up there about the, about the current situations in the North and the missing women that were many of them were my friends. And um, I kept on getting invited by QP to go and attend uh, with their organization. One year, uh, my good friend Sonia Wilson uh, made me a banner with the names of the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls from this community. And I went to Ottawa again, and I spoke. And uh, I want to say it was Jackie Hansen that reached out to me first, and she said, you know, we'd love to talk to you about your region. We know that there's huge resource extraction happening there. It's uh, industry-driven. And um, we'd like to maybe speak with you regarding that. Site C Dam was, was being um, reviewed, and they came all... Uh, the morning I was flying out in the afternoon and they showed up at my hotel, her and Craig Benjamin, and we had tea and coffee. And, uh, and they said, you know, we're, we're really interested in doing a, a report uh, about northeastern BC and the industry and the impacts that it has on Indigenous communities. That's the out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. And um, that got the ball rolling. You know, I kind of, I didn't realize how big it would turn out. Um, and how important of a document it would be. Uh, they came um, and visited here, and I took them around, showed them, you know, we went up the highway, and they made the decision at Amnesty that they were going to do this report. And, um, you know, they asked me to help in connecting them with community members, my input, my thoughts, and that uh, that spiraled, and... We ended up with a, with a really good, important report that should be read by by people in this region, um, because it it kind of gives you an insight into what happens in communities when this kind of uh, when this kind of industry resource extraction town um, has on its actual community members, not only indigenous community members but the whole community. What kind of effects does it have on specifically Indigenous girls with the transient men coming into town, working for short periods of time and then leaving again? Is that kind of what the report is? Yeah, well, it's it's actually all, it, 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 it encompasses everything that happens. And, you know, we know that, um, that typically Indigenous families live in poverty. Um, and when you're in a town such as Fort St. John and you have such huge, huge industry that is important, you know, we, we do know that, but it also brings in a lot of um, factors that people might not know, such as, um, you know, when, when you have a whole town that, that has this ghost population that shows up in the winter, prices go up, groceries, rent, um, utilities, everything is driven up. And those people that are already marginalized are marginalized even further. So they put themselves at risk. You know, um, we know that there, that there are workers in Fort St. John, uh, sex workers, um, you know, just trying to, trying to survive. And 
that puts them at risk. You know, a single mother having to work two jobs, one in the middle of the night where she's got to walk home, puts her at risk because she's trying to make ends meet because industry has driven up the prices of everything. Um, those are just a couple of factors that, that maybe people don't know about. We put, we put women at risk with, um, with abuses. Uh, and not only physical abuse, but financial abuse is a big one. You know, when, when we get uh, calls from women, it's typically, I can't leave because I can't afford to. Mm -hmm. um, if I leave, I'm not going to get any help. Where are we going to go? I can't survive without, without that income. So they stay. And those are just kind of the things that are highlighted in that report that most people wouldn't consider. You know, it's a choice of whether or not you're going to pay for your heat or you're going to be able to buy fruit, vegetables, and meat for your, for your children. Mm -hmm. um, and those are real choices that people have to make. You know, uh, if it's not for places like the Women's Resource Center that do offer, you know, um, groceries, clothing, um, places like the Friendship Center who sometimes uh, step in and help to pay a bill uh, if you're in an emergency uh, community bridge is fabulous that if it's not for those kinds of organizations um, that do step in it would be even worse you know uh, so those are those are very important points that are made in that report and you know I've said before that it was never about making uh, a dark light shine on Fort St. John but highlighting and showing the real impacts that happen and how can we do better? Yeah, because change can't happen until we know about the issues, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that was the whole reason for it. It was, here's some things that we need to look at to make this community a better one for everyone. You know, um, I've been fortunate enough that I haven't had to experience living in poverty. Um, but I have many friends that do. And, you know, we point them in the right direction and, and try and get them as much help as we can. Um, but if people don't know about those issues, then it is out of sight, out of mind, which is, you know, that's why it's named that. Um, and I think that a lot of people that read the report were like, wow, I didn't, I didn't consider that, that, you know, you can, you can charge $1,400 for a single shack with one bedroom um and that's still not really accessible for a single mom of two mm -hmm. um so it, it's really important to understand that all of that impacts the community and not only indigenous communities you know um it impacts all of us mm -hmm. and it's important for us to try and, and strive to do better for everyone yeah and the the women's resource society is Great. So if, if there's anybody listening that needs their help, they're great. Yeah. Same with Community Bridge. They're, they're pretty fabulous there. I, I know, I know for, for certain that they've helped many, many uh, families and women that are struggling. And just ask for help. Yeah. So a little birdie, and when I say a little birdie, I mean like a seven foot tall um, mammoth over there told me that you met Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell me that story? How did that happen? Where did you meet her? Uh, I was part of a project for the province of BC, uh, creating an Indigenous gender-based analysis. And that was going to be a tool that was used by communities, uh, the government, as well as industry to come to the table. And much like Out of Sight, Out of Mind, show what... Uh, impacts and things that happen uh, and ways that we can mitigate it. So uh, my good friend Anna Barley was helping with that and we worked hand in hand uh, and helped create this, this document for the province. And we, we were presenting it so we invited, you know, um, my friend uh, Mary Jane McCollum, who's a senator in parliament, came. Uh, we had chiefs, we had members of communities, we had women leaders, we had uh, industry leaders all come together and we held this event at the Four Seasons in Vancouver. And uh, we were on a break and I was going for a cigarette with my friend and 
he noticed her and he's like, there's Whoopi Goldberg. And I was like, okay, do not bother her. And he's like, I got to get a picture. So he goes racing down the escalator, the, yeah, the escalator, and he, they, they cross, intercross. And he's like, I'm a big fan or whatever, right? Can I take your picture? And she was like, sure. She was very gracious. Like, she was wonderful. And I come down, I end up at the bottom, and, and then she looks at me and she's like, do you want a picture too? And I was like, sure. So I take a really fast photo. My, my picture with her is terrible. I wished I had listened to my sister Patsy because she makes the best selfies. <laughs> And, uh, and then she tells us what she's doing, and she's like, who comes to Vancouver without rubber boots? So she was looking around for these rubber boots in, in the, the mall that's attached. And then she says, I'm trying to find the smell that's in the building, you know, um, but I, I, can't, I can't find it. And, and my friend says, oh, we're smudging upstairs. Would you like to join us? And she said, Yes. And we're like, I, I, I couldn't oh believe that this interaction was happening. Like, I'm just watching my friend interact with her. I'm kind of standing in the background, right? And then they start going up the escalator, and, and they, they, she kind of turns around, and, you know, so I go up there with her. She comes in, and she sits down, and we introduce her to our ceremonial people. And, uh, and she smudged, and she sat and listened to creation stories, and then, you know, when we were almost done, she looks across at the table and she says, what do you do? Like, what, what, why are you here? And I told her, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I work for the Indian Residential School Survivors Society. And, um, and I said, but that's my main passion is, is uh, advocating for Indigenous women and girls. And she says, you know, that's the same thing, you know, in the States. You know, there's so many um, Native American women that are missing, and we really need to shed light on that. And, you know, we should have a, a chat. And it was just like, okay, right? So th we ended up doing the ceremony. She stayed back, actually, and worked with them further. And we all left. But before we left, she came and she waved me over, and she had a piece of paper, and she was writing stuff down on it. And then she's like, here, I want you to write your number and your email on it. So I gave it to her. And I don't know, she's, she looks at me and she says, like, people don't, I don't believe in chance meetings. And I think that we were supposed to meet each other so that we can do work together. And I was just like, what, right? Wow. So she hands me the piece of paper and I just folded it up and stuck it in. And then I thought I need to give her a gift. So I took off my red jet jingle dress medallion and I said, I'd like you to have this. And she was just like, what? And so I, I put it on her and I lifted up her dreadlocks and, and she put it around her neck and she was just staring at it. And, and that was my Whoopi Goldberg encounter. Um, we actually have had conversations on the phone. I, I, it took me, I, I didn't call her right away because then COVID kind of happened, right? And I was like, I wonder if she actually really gave me her number and her address. I Googled the address and it is in fact her home. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and then I finally got the courage to call that number, and it was her assistant. And he said, you know, she's actually uh, doing a, an interview right now, a Zoom, um, but I'll tell her that you called. And so uh, I, I think it was like a day and a half passed, and then I looked at my phone, and it was a phone call from New Jersey. And I was telling my husband, I'm like, oh, my God, it's a phone call from New Jersey. And he's like, oh, it's probably, you know, like prank call or whatever, right? And I answered it. And she says, hi, is, there, is Connie there? And I said, this is Connie. And she said, hi, it's Karen. And that's her real name, right? And I was like, oh, how's it going? You know. And then we had like an hour-long conversation. And we talked about some of the things that we could do together. And, and she said, once the powers that be are out of there, I would like to, to make arrangements for you to come here and, and we'll work together to raise more awareness for, for Native American women in the United States as well as in Canada. And um, that is my Whoopi Goldberg story. Well, she has a huge platform, so that would be amazing if she... It's true, you know. you on this. So the, <laughs> the following Monday, my phone is blowing up. It was going crazy, and people are like... Because I posted a picture of me and Whoopi. <laughs> the, on the I think it was a Friday. I posted a picture of us, and everybody is like, you got to turn the view on. She's on the view right now, and she's wearing your medallion. And I'm like, What? So I'm getting, like, people are posting screenshots of it on Facebook and tagging me. And um, she didn't say anything about it the first day. And then I was like, oh, that's okay, right? 
And then I got the next morning messages after messages. And they're like, she's wearing the red dress medallion. She's wearing the jingle medallion again. And, um, and then she talked about it and she, what it meant. And that, uh, you know, she talked about the highway of tears, the book that one of my friends had written and, um, and said that, you know, you think it's bad going missing as, as a, as a person of color in, in the United States. She said, imagine being native American woman. She said, and, and they actually have to go and look for themselves. So it was, it was a really important conversation. It got like thousands and thousands of shares on Facebook. It really catapulted that uh, MMIWG in Canada and the United States is, is a serious issue. You know, I'm five times more likely to go missing or murdered than you. And, and that's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I, I do think that all of the campaigning that, that has happened, Whoopi making that statement um, is a testament that we're moving in a direction where, you know what, people are starting to notice. And that's what we've always wanted. I've made the greatest friendships of my life with family members of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. They have taught me so much. And the biggest one is that the human heart has the capacity to overcome such trauma um, and those heart-wrenching events that uh, that they can still get out of bed every day and still carry on, still do the good work, raising awareness, um, campaigning, lobbying. You know, those are the true champions. You know, it's those families that, that get out of bed every day knowing they don't know where their children are, but they still get out of bed and they still do their best and they still try to make a difference in this world, even through such an unimaginable event as losing your child or having your child murdered. Preventing it happening to hopefully another child? Absolutely. You know, there's some pretty heartbreaking things that you see on social media. Um, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because... You have, prior, a, you have a pretty big following on social media, right? I do, kind of. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a double-edged sword because... It, it now gives us that opportunity when somebody's missing to go, this person's missing, here's where they're missing from. Can you see her? Please share this. But it also is that, that opportunity for those horrible um, events that happen in the aftermath of it, such as Colton Bushy. And, you know, um, there's been some pretty horrific situations happen, and it brings out that ugliness in some you know, with Tina Fontaine, uh, with Cindy Galagy, uh, learning, learning what actually occurred and the injustice that happens afterwards, you know, with no charges being laid. Um, it really, it's heartbreaking. And I, and I sit back as a woman of my age now, I can't imagine what that's like for our youth to see those on on social media and to know that no justice was served what if that happens to them who's going to care about them who is going to fight for them and is justice going to happen because in canada there's two kinds of justice there's justice for for non-indigenous people and there's justice for people of color and and it's different and if you are one of those people that doesn't believe that then you have your head in the clouds because it's painfully clear, and it always has been. You know, um, how can the average listener listening to this right now make a difference? You know, we talked about this kind of earlier before we started that, you know, your silence speaks volumes. The time now to speak up against racism and injustice is now we can no longer be silent because the ones that are being vocal are are becoming you know this is this is absolutely my thoughts because that election that happened in the united states made it okay for the racists to come out and it was more rampant than ever after that Mm -hmm. a lot of my friends 
um, couldn't understand why I was so upset with, with what was happening in their support. And because I kept telling them, when you openly support somebody that can be so sexist and racist and just a disgusting human being, how can you possibly be my friend? Because mm -hmm. all the things that he stands for hate me for who I am. And um, the biggest thing that people can do is, is to start speaking out. It's not acceptable. You, you, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, well, I'm kind of, you know, I don't really want to get involved. And there's too many people that didn't get involved when, when the Holocaust happened. That kind of silence allows that type of behavior to happen. And now more than ever, we need our friends to say, you know what, it's not okay. That is not cool. And call them out on it. I think people don't like to feel uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. But now you know what that's like to be an Indigenous person living in, in, a war, in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, those uncomfortable situations and conversations have to happen. Yeah, they're necessary. That's how you grow. Yeah. That's how you grow as a human being. And, um, you know, I have, I have some, some really good friends on Facebook uh, that when somebody makes a comment like that, they're the first ones to be like, you know what, you are not cool and here is why. That is an old school mentality that, that ha there has no place for that anymore. And, you know, I've had people like, I can't believe you just let your friends gross me out like that. And I'm like, so you know what? You're literally making those kinds of comments when I actually have human rights defenders, legit ones that, you know, are international that have, that have gone, you know, to Switzerland and spoke at the United Nations. And you, you're trying to make comments and you're trying to argue with somebody that is well-versed in it. And I'm sorry that you feel that uh, you were attacked, but you know what? You were attacking me. You don't get to talk to me like that. And, and if you do, then I have dozens of friends that are going to come and tell you that that's not cool. And here's why. Do you think it's just lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of, like... Why are so? Why are people so quick to jump on social media and make those comments when they probably don't even really know anything about certain situations? Right? And in some cases, they won't say it in real life. It's true. They just hide behind very the keyboard, keyboard warriors. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, I have. <laughs> there's one that's local, and uh, and. He challenged me, and it was it it, it it's it's nonsense. And I, I finally I, I don't I block them, and I don't usually read comments. I ask people not to call to comment and tag me in comments because I just I can't take it some days. And now that we can hide behind a computer, and and say those things without actually having to have that weirdness happen, um, that's what makes it okay for people, you know. Um, I've said many times that this country has taught its citizens how to treat Indigenous people. Um, and I stand by that, that it is okay to make those kinds of comments. It's okay to post pictures of Indigenous people hurting and deep in addiction, laying in a bank and making fun of it. Um, it's, okay to, it's okay to let somebody that murdered a child and threw her in a bag in the Red River it's okay to let them go. It was okay for EMS in the hospital to have this child that was reported missing in their person and let her go. She should still be alive, but the system failed her because the system doesn't care about Indigenous people, as they should. They don't care about Indigenous people as much as they should. And so that's why it's important for, uh, for people to, for, to hold others accountable, right? One thing I wanted to, to bring up going off of that, um, the vigil for the 215 earlier this year that you and Helen had put together, uh, you had called out all the local dignitaries. Um, you had held them accountable. And, and 
in the past you've been known with local MP with a certain situation and, and certain things that he had said towards missing and murdering indigenous women and uh, and girls in a forum in 2015. You've stayed on him that whole time, and then he finally uh, apologized at the vigil earlier this year. How important is it to hold these leaders accountable um, moving forward? You're saying that no one cares about indigenous people. Well, so then does that look on everyone, go on everyone else to move forward and hold everyone else accountable and kind of do that justice? It it does, you know. um, That whole situation, I was asked prior to that if, uh, if this individual could speak. And I said, no. I don't want this to be a platform for that. It's not the time for that. Um, your actions should should have spoken way before then to to try and, and do some form of reconciliation. Just to put it into perspective, he said these this very, very, you know, I don't want to mention it because... Well, go and mention it. it. And in the Peace region, a lot of people know, basically he was saying that that wouldn't happen. There wouldn't be missing, murdered Indigenous women and children Sorry, if is, they worked. Is there is there a reason why we're not saying his name? I'll say it, Bob. Yeah. I'll you know, like, like, I guess I was just trying to be safe there, but yeah. Okay. If you want to, yeah. That's he he knows about. very well that, you know, I've, I've had issue with that. Um, that if we stayed on reserve, got jobs, and were happy like they want us to be, we wouldn't go missing and be murdered. Um, he took the opportunity to come to the 215 vigil. I was asked. Sorry, he said these things in 2015. Yeah. That's what he said. Okay, yeah. now moving forward to 2021. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 I was asked if he could have an opportunity to speak as a dignitary, and I declined. Um, I don't want that to be a soapbox for everybody because it wasn't about that. It was about honoring, honoring these young children that were found. And um, so I opened the mic and uh, an Indigenous man waved his hand up and said, he wants to speak. And then I looked and it was Bob. And, um, you know, Everything in me was like, don't let him come up here and use this now. And then I thought, no, this is it. We're going to have this now. And, you know, I called him out on, on what he said. And, um, you know, he spoke. He apologized. Um, I do feel that he was trying his best to be sincere. Uh, it took a lot of courage for him to come up and say that. Um, I was a little dismayed that he ended it asking if he could pray for us. Uh, you know, we're, 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 that whole thing happened directly as a result of the federal government and the churches. And when he turned and was done, I thanked him and then I told him that he should go back to those churches that he goes to and demand that they release the documents that we need to bring the rest of our children home. It's the right thing to do. And um, that has been the last interaction that I've had with Bob. Uh, you know, I, I did appreciate that that he held back and and knew that it was not his place to speak as a dignitary at that event. The dignitaries at that event were families and survivors, and uh, and I'm I'm glad that he respected that. Honestly, uh, when the whole thing happened, I was called by the Vancouver Sun, and they wanted me to make a statement. And uh, I kind of talked it over, and I thought, I'm not going to give him the time of day to respond to such nonsense. And it's very disheartening to live in a community that would have somebody that would speak such disgusting ways about Indigenous women and girls and win overwhelmingly in this writing. And that's, that speaks and is a testament to the kind of community that I was born and raised in, which explains a lot of of the struggles that I've had, the trauma, the abuse, the the racism um, that, you know, all Indigenous people in this region put up with. Well, just about two hours away, you have a a mayor who made headlines as well. Exactly. Again, in 2021, making racist comments towards indigenous people thinking it was okay on their personal facebook page i want to know where's the line so there's obviously the things that they're saying are horrible so 
if there are people who are saying these things and are just how they were, were brought up, they're just kind of ignorant to that fact and they don't know, some of them don't know that they're being racist. How do we help that moving forward? How do we teach these people like, hey, what you're saying is wrong? Yeah. Because some people are open-minded to like, oh, like I didn't know that's what I was saying. They grew up in a town of 300 people and nowhere, you know what I mean? And yeah. It's mainly they're white. Yeah. So how do we teach them moving forward? Like what, what do we do? You know, I think, I think one thing that, that's very important that when you, when you witness it is that when you're, when you're calling it out, that you explain why. You know, it's not enough to just go, you're a racist, and leave it at that. You know, explain why that's, that's a prejudice that you have, or, or you know, um, you, you, it's, it's like you have to, to reteach people how to be human beings and, and kind and, and compassionate and understanding again, because we've lost that. You know, um, I have so many friends that, they, you know, they're like, well, I know what you meant because I grew up and, and I'm white and people were racist to me because I lived in an indigenous community. And, you know, the, the first thing that they need to understand is that, okay, just being born white, you're born with privilege, privileges that aren't afforded to me, that I have to work twice as hard to prove myself in this world. And if you can't understand that basic that basic standard that just being born white, you, you have more privilege than, than most. That it, it's, it's so, it's so deep rooted and, and so like you have to go right from the beginning with many people. But if you're, if you're going to call somebody out, then, then know, know and teach them why, you know, I, it, it's not enough to go, you're a racist and, and you're you know, this and that, because you're not, you're not teaching them anything. And that's the important part of it, is that we have to teach why. You know, like if, if Bob can't understand what he said and why it was so wrong, that's a problem. And he represents us. You know, um, that I, I, I really hope that, that uh, one day, he he really gets and understands why that was so hurtful what he said and it isn't that um the problem is when we have leaders that are okay to speak that way that it's the same thing as what happened in the states with trump it was okay to be racist again because he showed them and and that's who represents us and does somebody with that point of view really represent you as a person? It isn't that, oh, you know what, he, he's done lots and, and he supports like industry and blah, blah, blah. You know what is more important than that? Supporting human beings and being, being that kind of person that has integrity and is human, you know, like... When I, when I heard that he said that, I, was, I lost my mind. I lost my mind. And I was so proud of Kathy Dickey for, for her response to him. I didn't. What was her I, response? I don't have to read the report. I lived the report. And, and it's true. Yeah. You know, how dare you ask me if I have read a report that's specifically about me and my experiences as a indigenous woman in this world? Um, those weren't the direct words, I don't think, yeah. but, but it was something to that. And I just thought, yes, you know, those are the kinds of people that should be elected in, you know, um, I really hope that, that there's a turning point in this region one day, you know, our youth give me hope, you know, they're standing up they're they're becoming educated and not only in colonial education, but their traditional education. And they bring that to the table, you know, that, whole um, life that we were always meant to live and my elders call it the good life and that's that, that's that life without alcohol and drugs that's that one where you get educated this way and this way and you bring them together and you bring that to the table you bring that um, that kindness and that compassion that empathy and then that knowledge that you have 
traditional and colonial knowledge that that come together and, and just create this amazing young leader that is going to lead the way. And, and then we won't have to deal with, with those kinds of leaders that, that don't put value on Indigenous people. Um, those kinds of attitudes are, are what makes it okay for us to go missing and murdered. Those kinds of attitudes make it okay for us to have to go and look for our own. You know, I had a, a pretty public falling out with a, with a local politician or two. Uh, when young Denny Poole went missing, they were, the family was trying to raise money for gas and food. And somebody vandalized these trees at the mall. And there was a call out, you know, let's find these culprits and let's put a reward up. And I sat on my couch and I was like, I, it was starting to boil, bubble up. And I was like getting angry. And then I finally just posted it. I'm like, you know what? How gross that thousands of dollars would be raised to try and find the culprits who chopped these trees down. And there's a young man missing and nobody's offering to help. We put more value on those trees at the Totem Mall than we did for this young man that went missing. And that is a testament to where our mindsets are, but where they should be. You know, and I don't know how we get there, but it starts really with people calling it out and saying, you know what, that's, that's nonsense. Like, think about what's important. Human lives are important. Women, girls, men, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, those lives are important, and that's where we should be focusing on. We need to start putting leaders in, in those positions that have those qualities, and unfortunately, we're not. We're putting more value on, on the the on the dollar, and and those kinds of things rather than on human lives. And I am so not um, anti anything uh, regarding resource extraction. I understand why communities fight. Um, you know, so many communities don't even have clean drinking water. And, and those things are real. And, um, but, you know, we, we, we can find a balance and we have to. So as just a regular voter, I would say my issue is lack of choices. There is no choice. You know what? You could put a paper bag on some of those candidates and just because of what party they run on, they're getting voted in. And that's the truth. You know, um, it's funny because people are always like, you should run. And I'm like, are you kidding all of a sudden, some video of me doing drugs will end up on Facebook. And I said, I ain't going down that road. And, and I said, I'm not built that way. You know, I love what I do. I love getting up every day and answering those phone calls when somebody needs help or, you know, um, organizing a workshop or going and supporting a family member in court. Or those are the things that are important to me. And, um, I do believe that you can find, a, find somebody to represent us that has all of those qualities. Uh, we just need to find them. Yep. But the truth of the matter is, is that there is no choices. You know, people, I have these funny pictures of me and Prime Minister Trudeau on Facebook, right? And it's a really funny one. My friend Wally made it and it's like, I'm with him just smiling. Um, this was before he became the Prime Minister. And then after, there was another one where I was like waiting for him to finish talking and it was my turn to speak and I was kind of you know I had this funny face and there's like before elections after elections and um truth of the matter is is I don't really support any political parties you know I actually like Jagmeet uh, I've met him uh, a couple times had conversations with him and um you know met uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth May uh but they they actually hold a little bit more of my values than than any other party but, uh, you know, it's funny when people ask me if I would ever run, and I'm like, absolutely not. No, I'm not built like that. I would be in the media for swearing or for doing something silly. It was funny because uh, the last time I was in Parliament a couple of years ago, I was with Senator McCollum, and uh, she was speaking, putting a bill forward. And I was standing there with Jackie Hansen, 
And Lynn Baik came by, but I didn't recognize her. And it's, you know, she's known for her race, like she's a racist, right? And, uh, and she goes walking by and I was like looking at her thinking, man, that woman looks familiar, right? And then after she walks away, Jackie's like, that was Lynn Baik. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? And she's like, because we get kicked out of here. <laughs> you know, but those are the kinds of people that get voted in. And it's unfortunate because there's so many good people that, that deserve to be leaders. We just don't put that value in, in that anymore. I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. I do too. You know, um, so many times I, I've sat back and it's funny because my kid will, will go, wait a minute, there's this article and, and did you go and do that? And I'm like, yeah, and he's like, wow. You know, like, because my kids don't really know a lot of the things that I've done. Um, and that is what I was always meant to do. I was always meant to be the mother of these two amazing young men and my husband who's so loving and supportive that uh, that my job on this earth after uh, after it all is raising two young, strong Indigenous men who value women. And... Uh, and I have no doubt that my boys are gonna are gonna do something great, and I don't mean by making a bunch of money or doing. The, I mean by being those role models, making a difference, and making a difference in the people that they encounter. You know, um, I'm so super proud of them, and I'm the luckiest person in the world to be able to do what I love and make a living from it, and have the greatest friendships along the way. So my last question today is, what does reconciliation mean to you? You know, the other, when that 215 happened, when he wanted, when Bob wanted to come up and talk, I thought, two things went through my mind. Tell this guy to get lost and he's not coming to talk because he doesn't deserve it. Or give him the opportunity. And I chose to give him the opportunity to show that we have the capacity to forgive. We have the capacity to change. And so I gave him that opportunity. I appreciated it. It's those small things, you know, with the way that, you know, Mayor, Mayor Ackerman now flies the Treaty 8 flag. That's respect. That's reconciliation. Um, you know, she's made comments that if you haven't um, done any work towards reconciliation, you're not welcome to try and access our funding. Those are reconciliation. Um, for the, just the everyday person, reconciliation looks like being, being that person that's supportive of, of when you see Indigenous people that are raising awareness. Support that. Speak out. That's reconciliation. Um, you know, it's, it's so much more than just a word. We have been so lucky at our organization, the, the support that we have received from across the country and around the world, um, recognizing the important work that's being done for survivors um, and children of survivors of residential schools and day schools in the 60s scoop. Um, reconciliation looks like those phone calls from non-Indigenous people saying, you guys are doing a fabulous job and I would like to help. How can I help? Reconciliation looks like my non-Indigenous friends messaging me and saying, can I come help at that ceremony? What do you need? Because you know what? I've never ever been to one and something in me is saying I've got to do something. That's reconciliation. It doesn't have to be monetary. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It can be something as simple as a small gesture saying, I'm going to come down there to that ceremony and I'm going to put some chairs away. I'm going to help you do that. I'm going to cook this for an elder. And having that deep understanding that we're all in this together and, and we can work together and it doesn't have to be gigantic or, or huge. It can be something as small as saying, hey, you know what? I don't like what you said and it's not right. Here is why and I won't accept it. Having That's, that uncomfortable conversation. Having those uncomfortable conversations. I remember in the old days, man, those conversations didn't really happen. They, they ended up with the punch in the lips and, and that put an end to it because, you know, what? once you've beaten somebody up, they usually shut up. <laughs> but now, now we have 
so much, so many tools to teach and to learn. And, you know, the Indigenous communities have always been so welcoming. We're having a tea dance. Why don't you go out there and check it out? It's the most beautiful thing to ever see is those women dancing the way that they dance. Like I, I've been to, I've been to ceremonies uh, and funerals out there. And, and I've always said that I've never seen anything more beautiful than, than their tea dancing and their, their, the way that they, they gather together and they dance to help bring their loved one up. And it is beautiful. It'll bring tears to your eyes and they welcome everybody. That's the thing is, is that it's such a welcoming uh, way of life that they have. And reconciliation means that go out there and learn and experience it because it's welcoming and, and everyone is always welcome to go. And uh, they just don't take people up on it. So th- those are my ideas of reconciliation. Well, thank you for being a leader in in this and Thank you for talking with us today. I think it's this is a great start for people to listen and learn. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I have always welcomed being able to to share what little knowledge I have. You know, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I have a lot of a, a lot of uh, of things that I that I know I still need to learn. But I make that effort, and and I'm willing to share uh, anything that anybody asks me. So, well, I have a feeling we're going to have you on again. So, <laughs> before we wind down, Connie, there's one thing I just wanted to bring up, and you don't have to answer or say anything, but you had a big impact on me. So, during the vigil, the 215, um, there was a woman who came up. She seemed a little intoxicated uh, while you were on the mic, and you spoke about her, but while she was coming up, you were also saying that you loved her, you were holding her, you were talking to her, and you were talking about the, the trauma that people have went through and not judging people on the streets. And uh, for me, not going to lie, I teared up a little bit when you were talking about it. And on top of that, it just made me think of like where I come from growing up in Edmonton. You go downtown, you see those people all the time, <laughs> you cross the other side of the street, and you're like, uh, you, that's, that's how I grew up. Yeah. And it just, it just had such a big impact on me thinking like you, you, you have to, you have to think when people, what are people going through? You can't just judge them instantly. And I, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up and just say thank you because it, it goes through my mind so often mm-hmm. when I see someone on the street who may be struggling or they come up to me asking for change instead of my mind going to negativity. It's thinking like, well, you don't know what they're going through, yeah. you know? And, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that. This especially because I was just such a, I don't know, it just kind of opened up my mind when you said that. Yeah. It was, it was a very powerful moment. You know, I really appreciate that um, because it is important to understand that, that every single Indigenous person you know has been impacted by residential schools and day schools and the 60s scoop. And when you start to learn about intergenerational trauma and that how they broke the families down, you begin to kind of get that little insight into why people are addicted, why they're on the streets, and how hard it is to get them to come back. You know, um, and then when you do see that person laying in the bank, you know, have a little bit of empathy and give them a little bit of respect and dignity. Um, It absolutely disgusts me when I see pictures that people have taken of somebody. I just think, how how are you raised that you think that it's okay to make fun of them instead of offering them help? And that's how I raise my kids. You know, my kids would never mock somebody or they would never walk by without saying, Mom, we should do something. You know, that's the kind of kids that I'm raising. And I really appreciate those comments because it's those small things that are reconciliation. You know, when you walk by somebody, really think about what they have gone through that some of them have gone through the most unimaginable things that you you couldn't even fathom and they're still here and they haven't ended their lives and they're trying and they're doing their best to just get through the day and sometimes that best means i need to drown this out 
I need to drown this pain out because I can't take it sober. And it's important. And, and I really appreciate you saying that. That, that actually really, uh, that really warms my heart to know that that, that impacted you because that, that's the whole point. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to start crying again. <laughs> <laughs> I've almost cried like five times. So. Uh, well, thank you, Connie. And we will have you on again. Soon. Okay. <laughs> so that was a really good episode with Connie Gray Eyes. And we appreciate her coming on the episode so much. But I just wanted to give a few numbers for anybody listening that might need them. Uh, the Fort St. John Women's Resource Society, the phone number is 250-787-1121 or Community Bridge is 250-785-6021. And there is an addiction treatment helpline in Canada and it's 1-800-663-1441. That podcast almost had me... Uh crying a couple times i'll be honest you know, yeah i definitely teared up let's let's throw toxic masculinity out the window right now and say that i almost bawled my eyes out because connie has such a fascinating story in that she had so much against her in life mm -hmm. with a lot of people who have a similar story especially and we'll start to notice that i i believe as we talk to more and more indigenous people is there's a lot going against them and you know a lot of people are coming out on the other side but there are a lot that don't either and that's it's it's different because connie's also working with those people where i feel and i think she would agree with this where she might have been one of them mm -hmm. you know what i mean so first off if you want to keep listening to this podcast if you like the interview make sure you subscribe to before the piece using your favorite podcast app or at uh, energeticcity.ca backslash podcasts. If you have a guest or program idea, email beforethepeace at musafem.ca. Thank you for listening. Bye.